Welcome to Civilian Carry Radio, a proud member of the Firearms Radio Network. This show is brought to you by our sponsor tonight, Big Tex Outdoors. Big Tex Outdoors' main focus is highly quality tactical EDC gear. They offer 100% risk-free shopping. That means if you change your mind for any reason, they will refund the full purchase price, shipping costs, and pay for the return shipping. So total risk-free shopping, folks. On top of that, most of their orders ship in 24 hours or less. Some of their items ship for as little as $1.99. They're an FFL and Class 3 SOT and they sell suppressors, SBRs, and other NFA items. Check out their website, BigTexOutdoors.com, and use the code CCRADIO for a 15% discount at checkout. And remember, folks, risk-free shopping. Our goal and focus of this podcast is to spread to the message of to everyday people the importance of the Second Amendment, firearm safety, education, training, and mindset. Remember, folks, you and only you are responsible for your safety and the protection of yourself and your loved ones. Our mission statement is, Gun ownership is your right. Safety and education are your responsibility. We have three rules on our podcast. One is no cussing. Two is no drinking. Three is no politics because gun rights and the right to self-protection is a God-given natural right. I'm your host and producer, Barack James, along with my co-host Tatiana on Instagram at Tatiana slash, well, all together, Tatiana Woodlock, who is the director of training at A Girl and a Gun's Women's Shooting League. And you can find her at www.agirlandagun.com and a member of the Walter Defense Division. Good evening, Alan. Good evening, Tatiana. How are you two? Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have the team back. Right? I was We're a little rusty, to folks. It's been a while. We didn't have Alan last week. We didn't have Tatiana, so it's a while. We're a little rusty, folks. Hang in there with us, I promise. <laughs> we'll, we'll be back on point. With our two guest co-hosts this evening, first up, Mr. Lee Weems, LEO, Chief Deputy and Owner of Fire... First person, safety. <laughs> Good evening, Lee. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, Brock. How about you? <laughs> a guest co-host, Mr. Rob Cavallari, IDPA shooter, Fred community member in support of the show. Good evening, Rob. How are you? Hey, good. Thanks, Baraka. Mr. An English major. Um, we are listener-funded radio, and you, the listeners and viewers, make this program possible. You can contribute to the show via Patreon for as little as a dollar per episode or as much as you'd like by going to www.patreon.com forward slash CC radio or clicking the link here in our show notes. A huge shout out to our $10 Patreon pledges, Mark B and Young Pei Chang, our $5 Patreon pledges, Russ A, Ira S, Rob, at, Rob C, Michael G, Scott D, Kirk C, David Y, FPF Training, W, William T, Greg G, Zar Light R, Michael T, Larry L, and Daryl L. We want to say a huge thank you to the people who currently pledge, pledge through Patreon. Your support helps us contribute to the goal of educating people on the importance of the Second Amendment firearms education, mindset, safety, and training. The views and opinions in, in this podcast are those of the individual co-hosts and guests and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network, Civilian Care Radio, and or their employees. Viewer discretion is advised, especially on live shows, folks. A message from the platforms that currently utilize to provide you the show, friendly heads up, platforms like Facebook and YouTube and ISPs are seeing unprecedented levels due to COVID-19 kids doing the extended learning so please be patient because there's sometimes lag and sound issues so keep that in mind over the few coming weeks and be patient with us folks tonight's guest is diana muller muller <laughs> VC Project founder, retired <laughs> LEO, professional competitive three gun shooter. And with her bio, I pass off to my awesome co host, Ms. Tatiana. <laughs> well, we are in for a treat, folks, because Diana is a pretty exceptional member of the Second Amendment community, an incredible advocate, incredible competitor. And so I am going to give you a truncated version of her extremely impressive bio. Diana Muller received a Bachelor's of Science in Criminal Justice and Psychology from the University of Central Missouri in 1992. She retired from the Tulsa De Police Department after 22 years of service in 2014, where her assignments included patrol, street crimes, narcotics, and gangs. Growing up, Diana's family's hobbies were horse shows and barrel racing, and while in high school, her father introduced her to USPSA pistol competitions. Throughout her career as a Tulsa police officer, she continued to pursue barrel racing until she found three-gun competition. She is a two-time USPSA Ladies Open National Champion and the 2015 NRA World Ladies Champion. Di is also a two-time IPSC World Shotgun Silver Medalist and took gold on the ladies team in 2015 and 2018. In addition, she's competed for the United States in two Pan Am American shotgun matches. 
Diana is the founder of the DC Project, a grassroots nonpartisan educational effort that brings women from every state to Washington, DC every year to meet with legislators on behalf of the Second Amendment and gun owners. Together with her husband, Ryan the Mullers, founded the Ambassador Academy, a five-day training course designed to foster more effective ambassadors in the Second Amendment community. Diana has been featured in American Warrior, The Washington Post, and America's First Freedom, and most recently in the Guns in America feature of Time Magazine. She's co-hosted Shooting Gallery on the Outdoor Channel, appeared on Fox News, and testified on Capitol Hill. You can learn more online at the dcdcproject.info. Ambassador Academy can be found at pro-3gunner.com. And you can find out more about Di on Facebook and Instagram at Di3GunGirl, D-I-3GunGirl. Di, we are thrilled to have you with us tonight. Well, it's like, uh, see y'all later. Nothing else to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just started bragging about you. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. So uh, did you plan on becoming such an advocate for the Second Amendment and being in, in, engaged in, in all these groups and all these things with your husband and and uh all these areas did did you plan this to happen or did uh was it an accident did you see something that you had to do how how did how did uh that part of your bio get get going yeah i had absolutely zero intentions of being uh, where i'm at even as a professional shooter or as a second amendment advocate i I was happy being a police officer and I love my job. And uh, really when I hit 20 years, I've told people that uh, I just felt like the Lord was telling me to leave. And I was like, no, I really like my insurance. I like my days off, you know, everything's going good. And, and uh, you know, I don't, I've never had like the Lord speak to me, but it was just like, just eh, leave, leave, leave. And I was shooting competitively. Um, and I did love that, uh, that, and I was shooting almost, uh, as a full time schedule and then going back to being a police officer. And that was really hard on me. So, uh, yeah, it took me about two years to finally concede and I retired in 2014 and we haven't looked back. And it was kind of funny because my husband, uh, we got married in 2014. So there's all this big stuff going on in, in our lives, you know, those big mile markers. Uh, and my husband and I got married in 2014. And about a month before we got married, he got laid off. He and about 100 other people got laid off from uh, he was a plastics engineer in an aerospace company. And um, he would have never quit that job. That was, you know, th that was a blessing as well, because I had a um, we had scheduled to go to Italy with Michael Bain and Outdoor Channel uh, to, to highlight Benelli. And we, uh, you know, we just had to go. He had to come back and go to work. And I had the time off. So um, once he got over the kick in the gut, I was like, this mm -hmm. is going to be cool. We might be able to stay in Italy a little bit longer and actually tour. And that's exactly <laughs> what we did. So that was kind of our honeymoon. And um, and he's never gone back to work. Now we're both in this space and we're both shooting professionally and we're both um, making a living in this space. So we would have never done that. No, we didn't plan on it. <laughs> so how did you get into the Second Amendment advocacy? Well, um, when, when we go to these matches, it's really easy for us to kind of plug in and be tourists uh, since it takes us all over the country. And we were on the East Coast, close to Washington, D.C., and it was a uh, bookend weekend. So we had a little bit of time in between. And a friend of mine that lives in Washington, D.C., she said, do you want to meet your congressman? And I said, I, yeah, OK, <laughs> thanks. Um, but really, it was a light bulb moment when I was sitting there talking to my congressman going, hey, is there something that we should be doing as professional shooters um, to reach out to these legislators. They're making some really horrible and misinformed decisions that really affect us. Uh, it was myself, my husband and, and Jerry and Lena Michalik. Um, so uh, I thought at the time that it would be easy for legislators and their staff to vet 
um, you know, the professional shooters because we're high profile and they're going to be more comfortable shooting with us. But mm -hmm. um, really, it, it turned out this the DC project turned out better than I had originally planned, just because now the diversity within our, our ranks is so deep that uh, the story really is a cross section of America. Cool. T? So tell us a little bit about Ambassador Academy. We right now are seeing so many new shooters, so many people coming to the range for the first time. They've all gone out and people are buying guns as fast as the pipeline can fill with firearms in the retail stores. And we're now having, we now have an opportunity to have a slightly different conversation. It's like the best thing ever because suddenly all these people are like, well, maybe now I want to talk to you about this. As before it was like, at the PTA meetings. Now all these moms are coming up to me going, so tell me a little bit more about what you do again. And, and when can I hang out with you at the range? And can I come please? Instead of like, maybe my kids can't play with your kids. Right. Now it's like, can I play kids play with your kids? Right. So it's an opportunity to have conversations we didn't have before. And I think a lot of the other moms within my girl in a gun chapter would all love to hear like your top three or four or 20 tips for communicating with somebody who's receptive and new to firearms, but doesn't yet know what they don't know about the Second Amendment community that they're diving into. How do we become good advocates? Oh, wow. Right. And that's honestly probably more down the DC project route because we really do dive into how to communicate with our friends, our family, and our neighbors. Um, now the Ambassador Academy, we can get uh, to that a little bit down the road, but we do handle hostile. One of our classes is hostile communications. And, and a lot of that is around the Second Amendment. But uh, to answer your question on, you know, the top three things of how, you know, what to do is really you need to um, empathize with them and listen to where their, you know, what their concerns are. And if you um, make that, you know, you've probably heard Robin Sandoval, she does it so well, the feel, felt, and uh, found method, you know, I hear what you're saying. I, I you seem to be, in, um, you know, concerned about this, this or this. Uh, but what I have found is uh, that education, not le not legislation is actually what I believe will be a uh, make me safer and my family safer. So you really have to listen to where their concerns are, regurgitate that and then um, just make that connection with them. Um, well, another thing that we talk about a lot is how gun rights or women's rights, you know, at the top of the, the show, you said something about, you know, gun rights are everyone's rights. And that's absolutely where we stand. That's part of the diversity of the, or the, um, the DC project is that we have, oh my gosh, we have, we have left, we have right, we have independent um, and uh, it, it is a constitutional issue. It is not a partisan issue and really getting people to understand that and knowing that, you know, if you're, if you're a left leaner, if you're a Democrat, you are more important to the second amendment community than anybody else, because then you can go back to people who you would align with or vote for and say, Hey, the second amendment is not a partisan issue. This is, and I support it. So uh, that's, that's another big thing when you talk, um, you know, inviting or, or basically don't offend people. Don't use name calling. Don't assume that just because uh, they are a left leaner that they don't support the second amendment. That was a huge thing for me in the beginning, because it's just so easy to fall into a, you know, mainstream media that um, that right goes guns and left doesn't go guns. But that ha I have found since coming to the um, the Second Amendment community that that's not the case. Um, can I ask a question about the um, the people that in the DC project that you choose on the state level? How does that work? How do women get involved? Do you seek them out? Do they seek you out? How do, how do the leaders of the state organizations? Uh, well, that's how, a great that question work? because it's kind of changed this past year. And 
Uh, when I first started doing this, I had no intentions on having an organization. I didn't want to recreate the wheel. I really just wanted to have a little bit of impact, go to Washington, D.C. I knew I couldn't, I didn't have standing in any state except my own Oklahoma. So I knew I was going to need at least one person from every state, and that's where it started. Well, we did that for about four years, and uh, really... It happened when I testified, it kind of switched me into another gear. I would always have to tell ladies that wanted to participate or heard about us that, oh, you know, we have uh, Tatiana in Maine. I'll, I'll keep your name and in case, you know, she can't come. Uh, but I really wasn't uh, collecting as many people as we could. It was very, very few. I couldn't herd that many cats. Um, but when I went and testified, we had this in our head. We knew Moms Demand Action and the red shirts would be there. And we wanted to make a visual. So uh, in pops the Teal for 2A campaign uh, and this educate over legislate message. And that's what we've kind of stuck with is we want to be a counter visual and a counter voice to Moms Demand Action that they don't speak for us. And uh, yeah, so uh, I forgot where I was going. You know, just how you select, you oh, know, oh, oh, representatives yeah, and that kind very of thing. Very good, very good. Um, so this year, 2020, as COVID and things like that, it kind of um, lent itself to this anyway. But COVID has given us um, a, a weird year anyway. So we really started pushing out. I asked these women that were going to Washington, D.C. with me, hey, will you step up to the plate and be the state director for your state and do the same thing at the state level? Because we saw what happened in Virginia. And if Virginia can fall, any of us can fall. So I really felt the, uh, I really felt the push to get down to the state level, which allowed us to open up our doors and, uh, and anybody can come in now as a delegate for their state. We'll just marry you with the state director and um, and then plug you into our puzzle and really try to grow our numbers to be a counter to the mom's demand action. Do you have to, or is it prudent for a state rep to go through the ambassador Academy or how does that kind of, is that a, a good symbiotic relationship there or is it a necessary one? It's, uh, it's not necessary. It is very applicable and it's very, um, timely now we do have we did have kind of a truncated state director training and uh we covered some of the same topics but uh, yeah but then i also had turned around and had a couple of girls from the dc project come to the ambassador academy as well so the ambassador academy is just a little bit longer and um the dc project will we train as much as we possibly can because we're all just normal average Joes or Janes and we are learning how to do this and how, you know, we don't, we're not professionals by any means. We're definitely a grassroots. And um, I'll just throw this in there that mom's demand action has a $36 million budget. And that was last year, not an election year, $36 million. That's what we are uh, going up against. And the only reason that we are doing something is, uh, or trying to be that counter is that we don't really see anybody uh, doing that. So, yeah, we need money. We need our Bloomberg. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It, it's funny that you say that because um, as passionate as gun people can be when they're sitting around each other talking about things, the, the anti-gunners definitely, even if it's a few, they definitely put their money where their mouth is and, yeah. and, and speak with really loud, sometimes shrill voices. Absolutely. They are definitely the squeaky wheel and they will, for some reason, I mean, I can't imagine that there aren't pro gun people that, um, you know, have that kind of money, but they Bloomberg, what, I mean, does he ever run out? It's just like, he's pledging $60 million to buy seats here, buy seats there and, and get anti-gun legislators in, which he was successful in doing, um, mm -hmm. in Virginia. That's where we live, the top row, the th us three. We all live in yeah. Virginia. Well, and, and how sad is that, that, uh, you know, November of last year, they told you what they were going to do, and we couldn't, as a community, go to the ballots and vote. We couldn't go and, and take care of it at the time, or we couldn't run for office. Some of those offices were not even con uh, contested or challenged. So 
Um, I've been asking my audience to not only show up to vote, but to consider running and, and running from anybody, anywhere from the superintendent, uh, uh, what's it called, the school board, to um, all the way up to a federal office. I mean, I feel like the bar is set pretty low. <laughs> so Go ahead and get in there, Lee. <laughs> Amazing segue. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, uh, as to demonstrate my plethora of useless, useless oh, yeah. knowledge, go Jennies. Uh, no idea what yeah. you're talking about. The rest about. of us have, have right. no idea what I'm talking about. I was about, a Jenny. You and I do. I well, was there a you go. tennis playing Jenny. Uh, That's my there college. You go. He must have researched it. There you go. Uh, I'm a division two guy myself, so I'm for here. Um, um, I also used to live in Tulsa uh, as a boy. I attended Walter Reed Elementary back in the wow. 70s. And I, I stopped by the old neighborhood a couple of years ago, and I was shocked to see that Garnet Road Baptist Church is now Plaza del Dios <laughs> Catholic Church. I'm like, there has been a change in the neighborhood. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so things have changed. Um, you, you, know, you mentioned you testified before Congress. How does something like that come about? Well, I, how, how, how do you get to that point? Right, right. That was definitely a uh, DC project thing. I mean, we have been going to um, the Hill for several years and we work closely with National Shooting Sports Foundation. And I got a call from them saying, hey, they're looking for a, a voice for a pro Second Amendment deal uh, uh, testifying against the um, assault weapons ban that they're considering. And I said, well, I would absolutely do it if you can't find anybody better. <laughs> but I, I mean, that's a huge deal. So if you can find somebody better, please use them. But uh, it ended up being me carrying the torch. And I was honored to I was honored to be there. But boy, I felt the weight of the world uh, being in front of them. OK, so that's something someone reached out to your organization about. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we, since we've mentioned Tulsa, I would be remiss if we did not, we can't have any discussion about Tulsa and not discuss proof that God loves us and that he created Brahms ice cream. <laughs> is that where, is that a Tulsa thing? It's an Oklahoma thing. Okay. Well, I'm yeah. more of the, I'm more of the uh, crinkle fry lover. I mean, their, their ice cream's okay, but they do have some great crinkle fries. Well, there you go. <laughs> So um, you got into, I think you said before the show, you got into competitive shooting before becoming a police officer. Correct. Do you, um, do you advocate that for um, police officers? Do you think that gave you, uh, at least in, in that aspect of, of, uh, of the job, you think that gave you uh, maybe a security or a, a, a comfortable, a comfortability that other people didn't have? Um, and uh, did, did, is there any negatives to it uh, that's for a, a police gr officer? I guess that's, that's a say. great question. And I am a huge proponent of police officers and the shooting sports. And let me tell you why. Uh, I First of all, it's fun. And it gets me behind my gun. And I become intimate with how my gun feels, how my gun sounds, how my gun performs, how to make it if it's something goes wrong. It gives me plenty of opportunity to screw up on the clock, which gives me some sort of, you know, the faux tension or the adrenaline that's going on. So um, exercising your mind through those, um, through those scenarios is, is a total benefit. And you can't get that when you say you've got 12 seconds to shoot six rounds and standing flat footed and in perfect conditions. So I'm a huge advocate of encouraging law enforcement to go. Now, what I have found is that, you know, my fellow law enforcement officers have egos that they don't really like to be um, seen as, you know, not the best or something like that. But I would, I encourage them all the time, you know, put aside the ego, go get your butt handed to you by some plumber that knows how to shoot your gun a hundred times better than you do and you'll get better for it. So uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, something that I recommend for people. And, and the downside, you know, I have heard police officers say it'll get you killed. And I'm like, I, 
I will take a C-class USPSA shooter over 90% of any police officers because they know how to, they know more about their firearm than, um, than the police officers do. So um, I, I think that when there's bullets flying uh, towards you, that you're, that it's kind of a self-correcting problem that you're going to seek cover. Uh, <laughs> and, and um, you have training for that. I think your brain is going to allow for one is a game and one is real life. Mm -hmm. Lee probably knows the details on him because he's an encyclopedia, stuff like that. But there was just recently, I forget her name, uh, and I believe she was associated with Terran Tactical at one point, but she, she was became a police officer and was involved in a shooting. And um, while her you know her uh if you want to call them double taps whatever were quick it seemed like her um abilities if you want to say they came from the competition world gave her so much time to um consider and evaluate in between and and and, and see what was happening with this victim whether they were going to continue or not where i've heard I've heard the complaint, you know, about law enforcement and, and, and competition not being able to separate them when it, when it, um, you know, if it comes to pass. But it seemed like for me in her video, it seemed like uh, it gave her a lot of extra time. You know what I, I mean? I, I agree. It's Tony McBride, and uh, yes. I think she did a fantastic job. But, you know, and then the other the other side of that is that she gets crucified for being trigger happy, and uh, you know, it, it's 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 a no win situation. If you have to use your firearm, whether you're a law enforcement officer or civilian, I mean, just this week the McCloskeys out of uh, St. Louis got charged by a grand jury, and now we are. It's just you know they are really definitely taking it to the gun owners uh, in these. Um, these liberal cities, uh, they are persecuting gun owners for sure. On the Tony McBride thing really quickly, uh, there's been a lawsuit filed against her in that, in that shooting. And one of the things that plaintiffs are alleging is that because she's a competition shooter, she's been trained to just burn things down without any deliberation and thought to what, what she's doing. And when I saw that article on that, you know, making the rounds around the internet, I went and Googled her up and I found videos of her, you know, shooting at Terran Tactical and she's running through steel courses, you know, quarter second splits and everything. When you watch the video of the actual shooting she was involved in, her splits slowed down to at least a half a second, 0.6 between each other. And they were very, very, very deliberately fired. She yeah. fired two shots. The suspect went down. She stopped after just two shots. And mm -hmm. how many times do we see videos of cops just unloading and running seven or eight rounds before they stop to see what's going on? Well, she put the first two shots into the suspect. He went down. He started coming back up at her. She fired two more shots, and she stopped at that point. And then she ended up having to fire two more shots in the fight. So six rounds total, everything was a hit. Yeah. And it was very, very, very deliberate. And that's someone who was in her logical mind. Mm -hmm. That was not someone that was being driven by emotion. And I think you can say one thing that you can get from the competition world is while the stresses are different, the fact that she's been up against running timers versus part times for so long, she's learned to control those emotions of the time pressure versus what someone who's never been in that situation has been. And Dinah, can you elaborate on that or, or uh, come on? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And uh, I think she'll be completely exonerated. It's just sad that we have to go through the mud to, to get there. Uh, one thing that I would like to add is that uh, scenario based training on top of competitive shooter, I've uh, been involved with a place down in Florida, we call it tactical Disneyland, <laughs> because it's just a fantastic facility. But it's all about uh, tactical and scenario based training. And there was, I was actually a student, I was in a student role and going through a, a shoot house and cries from my kid that I don't really have is coming from inside and the adrenaline's going. And, um, I remember moving across the, the room and my gun misfired and I tap, I didn't even, I didn't, once I made the decision to move, 
um, I tapped racked and went back to business with zero. You know, I heard it, I felt it. I knew what happened. I knew how to control. I knew how to fix it. And that's the kind of thing that uh, I attribute to all the years that I've been playing the game. T. So we have a question from one of our listeners who wants us to expand on what we were talking about a little bit ago about on the competition sports. Because, Di, you've got one of those like really well-rounded lifestyles. So you can speak to all facets of this as a professional competitor, someone who's been in law enforcement and all of it. Um, explain to, from your perspective, can you discuss how competition sports directly impact the civilian concealed well, carrier? Well, kind of exactly what we're talking about. I mean, the more intimate you are with your firearms, the, the times that you draw it, it's just, a, uh, it's not only practice, but it's practice under pressure. And, uh, and the IDPA game that r requires concealment, that's a great thing for uh, concealed carry people and you and you really it requires a little bit more tactical thinking with uh, slicing the pie what's that called tactical priority yeah there's things in the IDPA game that are definitely more tactically uh, real world type scenario stuff so there's there's a lot of great things th that uh, this shooting sports offers uh, and that's just two of them. I mean, I, I from a police officer standpoint, I shoot three gun, which is rifles, pistols, and shotguns. And so I know those three platforms like the back of my hand. I I know what they sound like. I know what they feel like, and I know how to I know how to um, function them all the way around. So. Yeah, any time you spend with your firearm is is well invested time. So as a relatively new person on the scene in terms of tactical shooting. I, I came from a different shooting background. Um, I don't, can you explain the relationship between DC Project and Girl and a Gun? Because there's a relationship there that I don't, as an outsider, understand. Maybe you can explain that. Sure. Well, um, uh, Robin Sandoval is on my board of directors and she is from the Girl and a Gun. And she's my IT guru. So uh, originally, the DC project was uh, like on a tab under uh, the AG and G uh, brand. And I actually begged them. I was like, "Will you please do this? Because I don't want to do this." <laughs> and they didn't want to do it either. So I ended up doing it. But that's how you know they helped me grow it. Uh, Robin helped me grow it, and she is still a very uh, she's a pillar in our in our board and she's our state director out of Texas. So there's definitely a symbiotic relationship there, but now the DC project stands alone. So, so do DC project representatives and people hopefully on the state level, do they kind of bleed over to girl and a gun or even competition or, you know, if, if you have somebody coming in, how does that factor into it? No, no, we have, we have actually, there's several different uh, ladies organizations, Shoot Like a Girl, The Well-Armed Woman, A Girl and a Gun, and we have people that represent uh, or participate in one or more of those. Uh, we have, we, ha we do have several women that uh, are competitors. Uh, Dakota Overland, she's 17 years old. She's from Minnesota. She's been going to Washington, D.C. with us since we started this, since she was like 13 years old. And uh, she's at the top of the three gun game right now. She is really uh, shooting strong and she's going to carry the torch. Uh, Beth Walker, she's uh, 18 years old, just graduated from high school. So we've got a lot of, of the youth in our organization. And then they also represent, uh, you know, all of these other organizations that we're talking about too. We've got one, mil there's a 1 million moms uh, against gun control they we've got women that represent that brand as well awesome i was looking at the statistics you know for uh because all of us on the panel have talked about how people have approached us that are new shooters you know and um and looking at nssf's data i think they said something like five million new shooters this year and 40 mm percent -hmm. are women mm -hmm. so my thought was as a, a competitor not from the you know, learning how to shoot 
you know, aspect, but the competition aspect, where do you see women? I think it's a perfect, you know, opportunity for women in sports. My wife just got into IDPA and she's doing really great. Well, just got in about two years. Um, where do you see um, new women shooters competing? Where is the influx and where is the need in different types of shooting sports? Uh, well, I would say that, you know, initially you're talking, we were talking about uh, Tatiana being buried with new gun owners and learning the fundamentals. Uh, it's really kind of difficult to feel comfortable walking straight into competition. So I would say m make sure that you uh, get to a basic handgun class and that you know the safety elements, you know the nomenclature, you know how it works. Uh, and then, and, and honestly, at any point, you can go to the shooting sports, go to USPSA, go to IDPA, uh, find something that your club does that's shooting sports related and just go out and help. I mean, the, that's what I fell in love with was the, the community, the people that uh, are in the, the shooting sports are some of the best hearted people. And they're going to, you know, just throw yourself on the sword and say, this is my first day. This is the first time I'm shooting. Don't let me do anything stupid. Don't let me disqualify. How can I help? How can I help? Well, you know, advance your adult life exponentially in any vein that you that you do. You just offer to, to jump in and, and be a help and people, people will appreciate that. Lee? Yeah, we've had a recent series on law enforcement training uh, in the United States. Um, could you describe briefly what the Tulsa Police Department's firearms training is like and just some things that you think that you need that we need to do nationwide uh, as far as addressing any deficiencies. Okay. What deficiencies do you uh, see? Sure. For, I'm sure it's very standardized training that we do at the Tulsa Police Department. I don't know what they, they've changed over the past six years, but, um, you know, we start with uh, the, geez, I can't even remember, 60 rounds uh, course, and we shot it over and over and over and over again, make sure everybody got qualified. And then um, the B-52 targets, do you remember that? <laughs> um, but, uh, but there's not a lot of, there is not a lot of scenario-based training. And, and even past the academy, once you qualify and uh, you're done with that training and you've been given, you know, you're, you're good, you're, you're good to go. Um, they come and they requalify once a year and, uh, they have an opportunity to come out and shoot like 50 or hundred rounds every month, but very few do take advantage of that. Um, so yeah, the, the scenario based training, if there's a deficiency, um, I want to say twice in my 22 years that I remember an, an elective, a in-service training that offered, uh, scenario based, truly scenario based training force on force. Um, and that was so awesome. And that's what I was talking about. Tactical Disneyland. I'll tell you the, the name the real name of it is West Orlando firearms training waft. And that is where the, the key to real good training is, is, uh, getting into scenario based training. So, um, having, knowing that you can get uh, cut, you know, cut with the electric little knife guy, or if you can get shot with a sim round, introducing pain. And uh, it, it really does make your adrenaline dump and makes you pay attention. And uh, it, the training is through is through the roof. So if, if the Tulsa Police Department or if any law enforcement agency uh, just sticks with the regular qualification courses, I think they're doing themselves a dis, dis um, Bad thing. Yeah, service. Disservice. Disservice. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, look at what we're dealing with with law enforcement these days. Everybody wants to defund the police and take money away from them. I mean, the reason that we only did it twice in the time that I was there is that we were always undermanned. We were always understaffed. We were always underpaid. Uh, so I don't see that, you know, the defund the police movement is the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard of in my entire life, especially from people who. Uh, are probably on the side that we, you know, for the past uh, 20 years have been saying, you know, you don't need your gun, just call the police. 
<laughs> and I'm like, yeah. okay, you don't get how that works. Bad, evil and bad people. So, yeah. yeah, that's where I would love for, for, you know, again, the Bloombergs or the money to, the, to, to really step in and subsidize the police departments having this really good training. And it starts with, you know, getting the UTM guns. They're just as expensive as a real gun. And they, they only shoot certain projectiles that aren't lethal. So wow. the, the training that's expensive. And then the gear that comes along with uh, training with live fire or um, with force on force is expensive again. So it's, and then you multiply that by, if you're trying to do a scenario, you know, you might need 10 sets of, 10 sets of uh, gear and 10 sets of guns, which is 10 times the money. So that's why police departments don't do that. And then they don't have to have the time to train. And that's why uh, WAFT is such an amazing facility is because they probably got 50 UTM guns and 50 sets of gear and they can do large base scenarios that uh, I've never seen any anywhere else in the world, in, in law enforcement, let alone for the civilian use. Cool. I was curious if there was any kind of uh, bleed over because, you know, Tulsa was, is home of what used to be one of the best firearms training facilities in the country. Uh, the U.S. was it U.S. Shooting Academy Correct. that was there. Was there a bleed over much between the firearm staff at the TPD and what was going on over at the Shooting Academy? Sure, sure. Actually, they're side by side. If you've been there, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we did have definitely we had influences like I was a staff for both of them and we had other police officers that was staff at the range and then did double duty on their civilian time as teaching at USSA. And funny thing is, is when USSA started, it was about 2008. Um, so when I graduated in, uh, in 1992 and moved to Tulsa, I stuck with horses. I was a barrel racer. So up until 2008, I didn't touch a gun besides my yearly qualification. And then USSA started and I forced myself to go back to, to shoot some USPSA just to get behind my gun. And that's when I fell in love with the people. So uh, over the course of the next couple of years, I uh, ended up 2011, I ended up selling all of my, my whole farm, all everything that I had uh, collected as an adult, you know, I sold all my horses, my truck, my trailer, my tack, I put everything that I did want to keep in a little pod and I moved to Tulsa, uh, Tulsa proper and, and stayed and started focusing on shooting. Nice. Um, <clears throat> just to brush back on a topic earlier, just, um, uh, uh, a friend and uh and uh previous guest on the show and one of our local barrel chested freedom fighter captain america types michael green uh he said interesting enough i felt more stress during matches than my first gunfight in iraq so you know just to kind of Right. Grab uh, that comment and speaking on what we were speaking of before. Uh, so congr congrats to Michael on getting his turbo pin. Oh, yes. Got his turbo pin from uh, Gabe White. Well, and part of that might be uh, the fact that, you know, we know that buzzer is coming. And when you don't know the buzzer is coming, you just simply react and uh, you don't have the time to feel like, ooh, the jitters. So that, but kudos to him for a serving our country and, and B making, um, you know, making a successful, uh, fight. Yep. Um, so my question is back to your shooting is, um, what was your, say your number one biggest in, in shooting general in shooting generally, um, what was your biggest aha moment? Like, Oh, that's how it works. And then, what was the one in uh, you know, specifically for competition? What was the thing that maybe some hurdle or something that you were trying that something you figured out that would finally got you to that next level? Uh, one of the most recent, I say recent within the past probably five years of being around the Michelix is, um, you know, you the seeing part the actual visual part of shooting you can't shoot what you can't see and if you can see faster you can shoot faster so um that kind of that has kind of clicked for me 
uh, just organically of being around. It's not something that I was trying to, you know, work on or go do a drill. Uh, but it was just like, ah, that's what he's talking about. <laughs> Vision. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question back on the uh, DC project? Sure, know absolutely. Kinda, the fun stuff is the competitive stuff, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I'm intrigued by this. And, and you know, I, you mentioned the fundraising, and obviously, uh, you know, you're up against a, you know, 900-pound gorilla with the uh, – um, with the opposition having funding from, from, from large, large donors, where, what are you looking to do in the future in terms of, you know, who do you partner with? I noticed NSF, you mentioned that, but that's not really a industry partner. That's an industry association, I guess you could say, you know, what, what partnerships are you looking to cultivate? Where do you see, you know, the, is it, is it industries and associations or is it just the industry? Where is that, money going to come from? Or is it from me and, you know, my, the viewers? Yeah, it's from everybody. Uh, we, we do have some success and, you know, we're really proving ourselves. So, uh, we're, we're landing, you know, on Capitol Hill and, and people are really realizing that the, the visual and the, the voice counter to mom's demand action is where, where it needs to be. And it has to be, it has to come from women. I mean, you guys, sorry to say you guys can't, be a counter voice to Moms Demand Action and incite why how they're wrong. It has to come from another another female voice. So that's why we're that's why I think that the DC project is so important. And um, you mentioned the nine nine hundred pound gorilla. I want to I want to tell you a little something something uh, that I don't talk about enough. I don't think, and that is um, the corporate activism that uh, last year, this time last year, I was, I had the opportunity to go to the New York Times and sit on a, in a round table. They have an event called the Deal Book. And it was an amazing event. It was very intimate. It was probably, I want to say 250 people that paid, I don't know how much money to be there. But they had a basically a 20 minute round table. This uh, one journalist named Andrew Sorkin, he, Andrew Ross Sorkin, he, it, this is his baby and he invites all these high profiles. I was, I listened to everyone from Hillary Clinton was there. Um, Kanye West came with uh, Kim Kardashian and they actually gave him the microphone and oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, it was like, you know, he was going through that whole um, submitting to the Lord type thing. And he was calling the media out like crazy. And I, I was like, are they going to cut his mic? And he actually said that once. Are you guys going to make me stop talking? <laughs> that was the most uncomfortable the whole crowd was. But everything else was things that they love. And um, there was Valerie Jarrett and all of these high profile CEOs, Airbnb, Netflix, um, they, they were there talking about, you know, kind of their deal. But the reason I was there was a breakout session. So for an hour and a half, I sat in a boardroom with, um, there were several antis. There were a couple of men that had lost their kids in the Parkland shooting. They were very angry and very know-it-all and very rude. And then there were other Levi's, Citigroup, um, Royal Caribbean. So these CEOs are there and they're talking about what their company is prepared to do uh, to combat gun, gun violence and um, what they can do to restrict. And I said, I, when I got the opportunity to go, I was said, well, I'm not going by myself. Can I bring somebody with me? And I asked Chris Chang to come. And uh, so it was just Chris Chang uh, against uh, everybody else that was there and uh, throwing harpoons at us and trying to avoid them. But what I heard them say, those CEOs are so, um, they're so focused on social justice and they feel like guns are the next one. They mentioned the LBGTQ issue and how they felt like they were on the front line of that. And now they want to be on the front line, the front uh, tip of the spear of this, um, the gun thing, the gun social justice, and they're prepared to lose money um, to do this. And how they do it, how, how they feel pressure to do it is through stockholder 
resolution. So let's say you go and buy a little bit of stock and then you go into these companies and say, I want you to do to stop doing business with the NRA or I'm going to unleash all of my follower, all of, you know, basically it's blackmail. Yeah. And you can see how that could have possibly happened with things like, what was it? Um, Yeti. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and some other things with the, specifically with the NRA, but um, the, just the, the amount of pressure that's coming from uh, the, the corporate world to really shape and usurp our legislative process to, do a, to, do, to enact their will over the will of the people. So that's really, that really scared me. And that really gave me a, an idea of what kind of monster that the 300 pound gorilla in the room is. So I remember when you know, we had Chris, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rob. Go ahead, when we had Chris on the um, show, Chris told us that it was harder coming out as a gun owner in the gay community than it was coming out as a gay, a gay man to society. He told us he gets so yeah. much constant battling right? and he was trying to, he's trying to educate them and saying, look, we are constantly ridiculed, picked on, assaulted. If anything, I'm trying to empower you so that can't happen. <laughs> and it's such a weird thing that people Same thing haven't with the caught women. on to that. It's yes. like you say you're for women, you're empowering women, but I'm sitting here telling you that the, 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 I am too. <laughs> so it's funny you, you mentioned, I, I can remember, I think it was Ruger, right? Didn't Ruger have to go against uh, to battle some corporate, um, some, uh, some corporate stockholder? Corporate activism? Yeah, some corporate activism internally uh, at the shareholder level. Uh, just a few years ago, if you guys don't recall that, they uh, they went in and and, and tried to, to to pull some shenanigans at at the at the uh, at the table. But one of the things I was thinking of uh, earlier today too is there's there's movements that I think that are um, undermining that corporate activism, like the walkaway movement you've heard about. Um, and there are a lot of we talked about it at the beginning of the show. Um, how a lot of people that we take to the range are not conservatives or Republicans. A lot of them are Democrats or liberals and not to get into politics because this is not a pol political show, but it goes to show that I think th there's a growing uh, consensus that this is a constitutional right. And I think, you know, DC project is perfectly positioned to take advantage of that, that, you know, that feeling amongst people, you know, it's, it's people like t uh, Tim Chang that, um, Chris. Chris, Chris Chang. Thanks. I was thinking of Tim pool. Uh, his show is something that, you know, gives credence to a lot of people that are like, no, wait, I don't agree with everything that's going on here. I may be gay or I may be a liberal or I may be, you know, whatever, but you know, these are my rights and you know, this is something that affects me and my family. And of course this year's events have really proven that out, you know? So, yeah. So it's, one of the uh, biggest things that came to, to fruition with us when we had um, um, John and his wife, uh, Sarah Hopman. Cade. Yes, Hopman from, um, what is it? Liberal Liberals Guides to Guns. Lib and guns Guides to wrote, Liberals? Yes, when John told us the story of when his he grew up in Philadelphia, downtown, um, his whole family is hardcore liberals and had been anti-gun up until the point where the Philadelphia police said, don't call us unless it's a very big emergency. Next thing you know, his mother is calling him saying, hey, there's someone trying to break into our house. It was his mother, it was his father and his uncle who had always been anti-gun up until that point. He immediately had one of his friends as an FFL go to their house, arm them, give them some basic instruction and follow it up with it. And those are the things that we've been telling people for years is that you need to take care of your own and you have some kind of responsibility and it's not a partisan issue. And when people's lives are on the line, that's a big eye opening thing to them, I think. Well, people don't understand that they are their own first responder. And as a first responder for 22 years, I know how long it took me to get there. And I was toe to toe with evil for, you know, many different times and waiting for my backers to get there. And it can be the most lonely seconds, minutes. You know, they say that uh, when minutes count or when seconds count, they're only minutes away. Mm -hmm. And it's totally true. But 
for some reason, it's really hard for some people to accept that until they are specifically in in that scenario and understand how. And I do think that 2020 and the riots and the defund the police has definitely opened people's eyes to going, oh, whoa, wait, wait. OK, so I, I, I want to hate the police, but how, what does that mean for me and my family? Well, yeah, the anti-gun like thing million, always five was. Million people figured it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's up to five. Yeah, yeah five million now. New gun but Diane, numbers, to, yeah. to your point, it's interesting because always the argument I always heard from everyone was, "I don't need to own a gun." That's what the police are for. And now they are opening and understanding that that's it's it's not enough for them. Right. So right, you are your own first responder. That's one of our definitely our staple conversations. Is how uh, you're responsible for your own safety. Before think, we let, go ahead. Sorry, Tom. Before we let Lee have his next one, uh, Daryl Weathers uh, in the chat wants to know how he can find the uh, DC Project group in his home state. Sure, it's dcproject.info. And uh, we only have one forward facing um, social media or reach out. We have the website, dcproject.info. And you can reach out and, and inquire, and I can try to pair you up with uh, your state director there. Um, but also on social media, we are DC Project Foundation on um, Instagram. And then on Facebook, we are the DC Project. DC Project was already taken, so we had to put in the the. And uh, that's our forward-facing pages so that you can follow us. I would love for everybody listening to, to give us a, a like and a follow on both of those. So there you go, Daryl. And if I know B, he's already got it in the uh, show. Yeah, I was so. looking earlier. There's <laughs> there's a uh, there's a um, a page on who we are, and it has your state reps there listed. You're missing one for West Virginia, the fourth most populated gun state in the country. We need to fix that. Yes, we do. <laughs> so, I'll, any of you Virginia West Virginia girls, give me a shout. I can think of a couple. I'll definitely yeah, yeah. Word out. Hook, hook me up. The uh, go ahead, Lee. That's your turn. No, no, no. Go ahead. If you got something. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, you talked a minute ago about uh, waiting on your backup. Two of the towns in my county are Bogart and Bishop, and we have a saying that Bogart and Bishop aren't that far apart unless you're in Bogart and your helps yeah. in Bishop. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I can remember. Uh, I, I, I can remember. Uh, being alone with a guy that was going to get arrested for domestic violence and his dog had already uh, defended the wife and chewed on his leg a little bit. And I had my pepper ball gun. I was the first one to him and he's walking down the street going back to the house and I was lighting him up. And I just, you know, like the, those splits you were talking about, my splits were like probably three seconds and I'm giving him commands every time, you know, you know, stop, get down on the ground. Da, da, da. He's a big old boy. And he had, no, he did he looked at me and he goes, you're going to run out of those at some point. And I said, if I do, <laughs> you are not. <laughs> this is the good one. Like what comes after that. Yeah, yeah. they're going to be a, a little bit harder and coming a lot faster. I shot him 36 times and he did not care. Uh, mm. I, I don't think that the, the general public understands the speed at which violent encounters happen. And the fact that there are people in this world that just are not impressed with having a gun pointed at them. Exactly. And more and more so even, and even today, I feel like mm. what we've seen, especially since I retired, that was the year of Michael Brown and, and St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And since then you have seen uh, the, the, just the really erosion of respect for police officers all the way up until this defund the police thing. And every, you know, we want to scrutinize every, uh, every um, encounter that the police have. And, you know, some of them may be bad decisions or some of them may, but I've had conversations with people in our community, you know, they the cops are going out there and hunting uh, black man and I, I'm just like that is not true. I do not believe that. I do not believe. I do not believe that the guy involved with the George Floyd incident got up that day and said, "I am going to go look for a black man to murder on camera so I can destroy my life." That is just not the case. And you know, it took how many months for the previous ten minutes of George Floyd's, you know, actions and his decisions that could have 
led to a different outcome for his life, you know, some personal responsibility on his end. And, uh, and, and now our entire country is on fire because of uh, this guy who was totally whacked out of his mind. And uh, any, any custody and death is a, is a bad deal, but I, I'm not convinced that um, it was a neck hold that killed him. Uh, seeing the, you know, after at least one of the autopsies showed that he had so much, you know, a, a lethal dose of what fentanyl in his system. Fentanyl, yeah. 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 I had, uh, one of my guys was involved in a shooting a couple of weeks ago and for 17 minutes, 17 minutes, he tried to talk this lady down. Yeah. And she, she had already she'd already chased a guy out of his house, had already stabbed a dog, chased a guy out of the house with a knife, stabbed a dog, and then hit the man in the head with a pole as he looked back through the window of his own house. She ran the pole through the window and smashed him in the face. And when our deputies confronted her, um, yeah, they were ended up about eight to ten feet from her, and she's standing there holding a knife and a lit blowtorch. Uh, screaming incoherently, starts talking in other languages. Um, you know, obviously she's in a, in a in a very manic state. And then she tell, looks at the deputy and says, "I'm going to kill you," and charges him with the knife. And and, and he, he's forced to shoot her. And there are people in you know out there that are saying you know criticizing the deputy in that. She was Action. having a mental episode and she's not yeah. a bad person. And right. uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you go, you go up there and Mr. Social worker and you deal with somebody trying to stab you and see how, yeah. uh, see how mm -hmm. real life works. Here's a newsflash people. The EMTs don't come until we have the scene secured. Mm -hmm. Social workers aren't going to come into an active scene like that. They are not coming. Well, and I think that the entire thing that you're seeing in these, uh, you know, it goes back to, I believe that's the liberal policies that are the hands off of doing anything for the criminals. The criminals are not being, the protesters are crossing over into being criminals and they're not being held accountable for their criminal behavior and it's emboldening them. And it's not doing anybody any favors because at some point, they are going to go somewhere. They're going to do some, the same exact thing that they, they really believe that that what they're doing isn't assault. I had an argument oh. online and, you know, I said this guy had a, a stick, a pole, and he was kind of charging at a police officer face to face um, saying that I got my stick, too. And I said, you can't do that. That's illegal. You can be arrested for that. And so, no, it's just. It's First Amendment protected speech. And I, I, I mean, everybody on my page was like, no, it's, you know, U.S. this and this and, and cited, cited law to them and, and they don't get it. They, so I don't think that they're doing um, these kids any favors by allowing their criminal behavior to to go on. I mean, really, it's like spoiled children. You know, if you don't, if you do not, if you do not discipline the child, the child is going to continue to do what he can do, what he wants to do until he runs up into somebody that, that says, no, thank you. Whether that be a teacher, a law enforcement officer, or, you know, somebody down the road, a boss. And then they're, they're just totally destroying these kids' lives. And that Diane, I have this analogy is, is, is children. And, uh, and unfortunately, um, the exact opposite, the exact opposite result, the, the result is going to be the exact, exact opposite of what they are saying they intend to happen by defunding police, removing police, all these things. The very people that they say that they're wanting to protect are the people that are going to get it the worst because right, right. everybody else can move away from it. So right. I've seen two videos this week that one was um, actually it was a couple of weeks ago where the a um, the bunch of ed educators, principals gathered and they're out there literally begging the police to come back and do their jobs for the sake of their children that attend the schools, that want to come back to school, that want to be safe. And the other one was I just saw two nights ago. It was in Portland, Oregon. And it's, it's exactly what you were talking about, Diane. There was a, gra a group of about 10 people a police officer on a motorcycle pulled someone over. They came and disrupted the arrest 
um, so much to the point that the guy got to, to pull away from the police officer who was trying to arrest him. He wasn't even trying to arrest him. He was just questioning him at that point. But the guy pulled off because the crowd emboldened him. Then the crowd gets even more emboldened. They keep coming closer to his face. So he tells them to back up, back up. He's pushing them back. They're like, don't touch them, don't touch them. So he just had enough because he they started closing in like hyenas from the back, you know, around mm-hmm. him, surrounding him. So he gets on his motorcycle because at this point he was smart to get out of there because I could tell that this was going to escalate and they were going to jump on him. And the woman jumps in front of him and starts blocking his motorcycle. So he just took on and off and knocked her over and they all pursued him. And I'm glad he got out of there because that... I, I could see where that was going. But Alan and I talked about this. When we grew up, there's no way we would ever disrespect a police officer like that, much less cuss, throw bricks at, do these things. It's just ridiculous. Like completely lost all, even human decency, much less the fact that they're a police officer. And then well, states are, are removing that protection from them too. Virginia just did it. Yeah. And then you've got the wall of moms where in Portland or Seattle, uh, where, you know, you wonder where these kids get their <laughs> respect for law and you got moms out there protecting these Antifa kids that are just destroying the city. And it's like, you know, I want to look at Portland and I'm like, is there nobody, uh, you know, is everybody that crazy? Is, is that OK with everybody that lives in Portland? And why are, is somebody not, um, you know, going to the mayor's office and saying, hey, you need to do something about this? Where are there no normal people that want? security and safety and normalcy back in their lives i mean what is going on in portland and seattle i don't i don't understand see i think there is i think it's just like what what you see in the news now i mean what you see in the media now is the people that when they show you what america looks like in the media let me tell you something i'm in america like my job my my business takes me to I've literally dealt with the some of the richest people in the world, like in the two digits of the richest people, you know, from nine to, you know, I mean, uh, five to nine of the richest people in the world down to people that can barely afford to do what I'm doing for them of every race, color, creed, religion, everything. America is not what they show you that they are. I deal with I, I see decent, good people. You know what I mean? I see people mm-hmm. that that believe and 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 want to live the way that 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 we're talking about, and I believe that's the same thing they're showing you on the news. Whether it's a a a, a, a black neighborhood, a white neighborhood, a Hispanic neighborhood, other than the people that are doing this bullshit uh, crap, <laughs> <laughs> that Me? nobody else wants to live with that. You know what I'm saying? Just because you live in the ghetto doesn't mean that you want this kind of crap going on all the time it's you can't get away from it so i don't i don't believe that it is i believe it's they're showing you what they want to show you for you to believe what you want to believe well and but, the, the bad part of that is that it uh, you know it's it, like we said it's emboldening them and it's like it's like a cancer i mean if the cancer doesn't get addressed if the cancer doesn't get stopped uh, the cancer is going to spread. And that's what the mm-hmm. media is doing for that movement is making it look cool, making it look like, you know, that's the thing to do. Um, and, and that's the sad, you know, de- the devil, the media is the most effective devil in America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, a year ago, there was massive pressure to make <laughs> sure that there were police officers or, or cops in every school in America. We even had we even had a bill introduced in the state legislature here in Georgia to mandate it, where the state was going to actually put a state trooper in every school. Of course, the bill didn't pass, and then now, you know, less than a year later, we've got demands to have SROs pulled out, SROs school resource officers right. pulled out of schools, and one of the nearby counties does, you know, has their school system has their own police department, and those guys are worried they're about to get eliminated. That they're just about the whole agency is about to get dissolved on this whole issue. Now, why a year ago was it, oh, we've got to have an officer in every school, but then now we don't want them anywhere around the schools. Yeah. Nothing. Well, and that's where I say that it's really important for people that if you don't like what you're seeing in uh, your state, your local, or your federal um, legislators, that you're going to have to run. And that starts with the school board. 
the, the school boards are definitely uh, being uh, packed. And I don't know why uh, they're, you know, I just had a lunch with a Tulsa representative, a state representative that lives in Tulsa. And they told me that there is not one conservative voice on the Tulsa Public School Board. And uh, that they are definitely shaping our children as they uh, as they go forward and uh, with the message that they want. And, and you know, it's usually socialism and um, America is not so great. And that's why bipartisanship is important. We, we're supposed to have balance. I remember right. when I first joined the NRA, I'm 47. I joined when I was 16. And I remember the ballots when it was time to vote. There was Democrats that were supported by the NRA and there was Republicans. It Absolutely. was a very even keel. And we are so far away from that now. And it's a shame. When did that start hard. going down? Like the like twenty the past twenty years? Just seems like, you know, and 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 I feel like the old the what would you call those? The blue collar Democrats? Is that what they're called? Uh, the old blue school dog. kind of blue dog Democrats. Mm -hmm. They they uh, they definitely I think it was definitely a, a Second Amendment support uh, back in the day, but that has definitely taken a turn to the point where their platform is, uh, their party platform outlines how they're going to dismantle uh, the firearms industry. So I, I, our liberal friends have a lot of work to do in, in that saying that, you know, say, say, stop the attack on the Second Amendment. This is for me as well as uh, any, any legal American. I think they're getting it now, Diane. I really do. I see a big change and a big, um, a big, I mean, I, I personally here in Virginia, I've seen it. I, I, Alan, uh, where was that, Alan, that you went out and, re, uh, and went to that you said you couldn't even get a standing room that time? Oh, Alan, Cul was it Culpepper? When the, the meeting, oh, the, yeah, yeah. Oh, the oh, board. That, that was here in our, in our. Oh, um, right. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, it's, but see here. That also really, really pissed me off, too. It's like Why? you were talking about what happened in Virginia, mm -hmm. you know? Well, after, you know, the election goes through and we get what we got, we have a, 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 a Second Amendment rally that had enough people there that could have changed the outcome of the election. So, why, well, where I'm glad to see people rallying for their rights if you'd have showed up in the first effing place at the polls, we wouldn't be in this situation. And it's so funny because when Barack and I, well, I was, and I was one, you know, as far as the training part of it. But when you try to tell a hunter or somebody that grew up with guns and grew up shooting, hey, you should come take this. There's a cool pistol class coming. You come. <laughs> I've been shooting my whole life. I don't need that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, that it's was the you, same brother. Th those people are like that about training. They're the same ones that aren't voting. Yep. Hunters, you see these people that, that hunting is like everything. You can't get certain jobs done, construction jobs done, the first yeah. two weeks of November. It's not happening in Virginia because of <laughs> whitetail true. season. You know That's what I mean? Right. And But those are the very same people that don't vote. And they're pr it's almost like they're proud about it. You, you want to vote? I don't vote, man. I've never voted. You know, I don't well, mean, and, you know. And, and, and the sad part of that is that once the election happened and those they started proposing all those laws and we did wake up, then we started responding. We started going to what is it like 98 percent of the counties in Virginia went to Second Amendment sanctuaries. Yes, but right, the, that's right. the other one, they don't care. They don't care. And then January rolls around. We have an amazing um, force of 50,000 people that mostly armed and we pick up after ourselves. We prove that we're mm -hmm. not a threat. And what do they do? They still do the exact same thing. They were not listening to the constituency and they don't care. So that's what's so important. That's why this election is so important is that we get out and we, uh, and we talk to our friends and our families and our neighbors about the importance of this election. So Definitely, uh, because if it can happen in Virginia, it can happen anywhere. And there's, you know, I have supported, financially supported so many. I don't think I've ever financially supported a candidate. And I have, I have jumped in and supported, you know, whether it be $10 or $50 or $200, 
to these different um, to these different candidates all across the country because I realize that this Bloomberg money is somebody's got to do it, and I'm going to chip in and and whether it be my time, my talent, or my treasure, I'm going to chip in and do what I can to for my candidates. But Diane, one of the things I want to tell you is Phil Van Cleve uh, from the VCDL mm -hmm. when when you were saying about the sanctuary communities, he has me speak on whenever a lot of times when he can't make it, I go and I speak for the VCDL. I've done it here in Loudoun a bunch of times. And the thing is, we've had so many people who typically vote liberal or democratic who are now turning the tide and understanding that. And I'm glad to see it. But it's just like Alan said, it's a little too late. Like a lot of those, they were pulling some of those rallies and a lot of it was brand new gun owners. It was a lot of people who have never thought about voting. And to Alan's point, when I go, I hunt on Alan's property, I'm up at the Sheets, which is right near Alan's house at three in the morning, you know, getting some coffee. And there's 50 guys out there in the parking lot talking. And exactly what Alan said, I'll go up to him and say, hey, man, you guys hunting stuff. You guys vote? Nope. <laughs> I mean, yeah. just they will just flat out tell you, no, they come out to hunt. And they'll go back to their work, their well, work, and they don't just don't care. I'm pretty sure that the Virginians are paying attention now. I just hope that the rest mm -hmm. of the country can kind of learn from what they do. Well, I got to get to asking everybody to uh, what they got going on, but I do want to say one more thing about that rally. Um, every type of person that you can imagine was there. There yeah. was not a demographic that right. wasn't. I'm talking, uh, you know every race and color uh every nationality age um, demographic every, every yeah, economic socioeconomic yep and everybody was cool i tell you what i don't know that you could have been more crowded like it was literally you were wall to wall face to face every Being if it a college was bar <laughs> if it was anything <laughs> if it was anything I mean, it could have been a Miley Cyrus concert. There would have been a fight. Yeah. I mean, if it was a, a Christian rock concert, there would have been a fight. Just you can't have that many people that close together bumping up to, and not be a fight. And nothing happened there. Uh, it an was armed society amazing. is a polite society. Yeah. Alan, I, I bumped into a guy. I went to that rally. And the first, the first 10 minutes, to be honest with you, I was a little... I was a little worried, you know, oh, I'm like, yeah, I said, there's a lot of guys here. I mean, there's a lot of guns, but after yeah. about 15, 20 minutes, you got a feel for the crowd. And yeah. I bumped into a guy and I turned around to say, I'm sorry. And he's holding up a sign and it says, you know, Democrats for the second amendment. It was pretty funny. I got a yeah. picture with it. And so, yeah, at the end of the thing, Diana, you were talking about it. People were scraping stickers off the ground. It was amazing. You know, yeah. and it was a cold day yeah. yeah cold very cold but yeah you know, i really wanted to be there it's uh it, it's we'll see if the tide changes we'll see who knows yeah hopefully well one of the things that you guys touched on earlier and talked about was the ambassador academy um and i i don't i don't want to leave without talking about the ambassador academy so when when i said something about you know working with michael bain and being on the outdoor channel i would see the shows and i was so nervous and i hated being in front of a camera and I was like, Michael, you know, teach me something, tell, you know, tell me something, what, direct me, do something, help me be better. And he's like, oh, no, you're doing fine. And I'm like, no, I see the show on Wednesday night. I can see I suck. I want to be, I want to improve. So it was there that, you know, for years I chewed on things of like, I really want to be better at being on camera and um, doing product evaluations. And I really... And then when I, and then social media hit so big, it was like, I don't know how to do social media. It's so frustrating. I don't know how to do the analytics. I don't know how to prove what kind of return I am. Um, and, and that just added to what I wanted to learn. So filming and editing, you know, I, I, we can film all day long, but I really didn't know how to edit. I had to teach myself how to edit. So uh, there were so many things as a professional shooter uh, and not even a professional shooter, just life that the ambassador Academy really talks about. And part of it is, is speaking, um, on camera. Part of it is the film and edit. And I just hired subject matter experts in all these different areas, brought them under one roof and organized and manipulated and have a five day training. So 
turned out to be great. We have it at the Tactical Disneyland, the loft that I was talking about. And it's just such a five-star facility that, um, you know, it really feels uh, very elite. Uh, and then the training, we do a one day of training in his realm. And so I feel like anybody that's in our industry that is around guns, is with guns or is a Second Amendment um, advocate, they really need to have that practice of having those hostile conversations and have, you know, getting beat up about why does anybody need an AR-15, you know? You need to practice on how to answer mm -hmm. uh, that without, without you know, stepping over yourself or, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a window there that you have their attention and that you can say something intelligent. And if you don't do that, then you've lost that opportunity. Right. All right. We got to find out what everybody's got going on. Lee, uh, what do you got going on? Uh, where can people get a uh, hold of you? Are you out of the COVID training thing? Are we doing that now or what's going on? Yeah, right now, the limitation yeah. on training is ammo supply. Uh, the mm -hmm. demand is at an all time high, uh, at least since I've been in the business. But, uh, you know, just nobody can get enough ammo to do you know full on one day solid one day classes or a two day class uh, so what i've been doing locally has been putting together like 50 right. round workshops and just been going out for like two or three hours at the range of, with a small group uh, i've got one of those coming up october the 18th i've got three spots left in that uh just outside of athens georgia i'll probably be running one in november um and then you know as y'all know uh, my time as chief deputy is coming to an end December 31st, uh, moving to a full time uh, into the training unit uh, January 1st when the new sheriff takes office. And uh, I'm probably going to take a little time for me uh, January and February. I have not had a weekend off that did not involve um, going to a class, either teaching or as a student in quite some time. So I'm going to I'm going to take some me time. Um, in January and February and find out what it's like to not be on call <laughs> and not have to answer a cell phone. I might actually read a book uh, for the first time in forever uh, that doesn't have anything to do with guns, like a novel or something like that. Um, then TACCON's coming up in March. I'll be teaching uh, four blocks at TACCON. And then um, Dave Spalding is going to host me um, early nice. next year, probably May or June up in Ohio. Uh, to kind of help get kicked off, because now the one uh, one other benefit of this whole change is that uh, I will actually be able to schedule things long term, oh, and awesome. uh, so that's going to be a benefit of uh, of the change. And so Dave wants to help get that started, and I'm very appreciative that he has uh, uh, taken this step to try to reach out and get me get me going. And what are you so, teaching with him? Uh, we're going to do a one day carbine class and a one day right. pistol class at his range up in Ohio. Don't have all the details as far as dates and everything cool. yet. Still working on that with the club. Uh, the club specified that they wanted a one day carbine class. And that's one area that I've kind of stayed away from. Uh, but I'm going to work on something like close range for the distances that you have to deal with inside of homes. Not necessarily close quarter battle, but uh, dealing with things like mechanical offset, things that. So you bought an AR 15 but you're going to be using it inside your house. What do you need mm -hmm. to know? Uh, that cool. kind, of, kind of thing. Uh, if anyone is interested in uh, uh, hosting a course um, next year, uh, Lee at firstpersonsafety.com is how you can reach me. Um, you know, if you can get me 10 to 12, 14 paid students, uh, we will travel. But, uh, you know, I need it to be kind of in that kind of ballpark, at least 10 and uh, before we can make a go of it. Cool, Rob. What do you got going on? Well, tomorrow I'm gonna I'm gonna blow through some buck around 45. I'm in a two day class with uh, Hilton Yam for uh, 1911s. So I'm I'm bringing Wolf ammo. So I know you know 1911s are historically jamomatics. I'm gonna put it to the test, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do two days of Wolf uh, steel cased ammo in a 1911. That should be. Is that an armors class that goes with it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I believe it's a uh, it's a disassembly and lube <laughs> class along with a. No, I'm just kidding. It should be fun. It's uh, I'm I'm deficient in that platform, so it's going to be fun. And then uh, Saturday's IDPA match. Next weekend is uh, a Tim Chandler and FPF training is uh, they're doing a shotgun class, so I'm doing that. Uh, 
doing Masada Ayub's class uh, this month as well. So this is this is Guntober for me, and uh, gun training. And um, let's see. I think. Uh, oh, okay. So why don't I uh, get right into the? Uh, oh wait. <laughs> we got to get Diana first. <laughs> okay, no, no, okay, yeah. Good. And Rob, the reason why. Um, you're deficient is is because it was obsolete after World War II. Back to you, Africa. <laughs> Two world wars, Brock. Two. <laughs> you you have to sing over there while you shoot that 1911. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's gonna be uh, a, it's gonna be all right. D- Diana, what do you have going on? Uh, anything you want to put out there, and where can people get a hold of you? Sure, sure. Uh, Guntober is uh, for me as well. A lot of things got pushed into this month. So next weekend we go to Shootout Lane at the Mitchellick Ranch and have a match there. And then from there I go to Florida for the WAF training. And there's a class that weekend. And then I come back to uh, actually uh, the 24th of, of October is a virtual experience on the second amendment rally. So it's two a rally.com and I'll be speaking virtually there. And then the next weekend is our big, uh, DC project fundraiser at Revely peak ranch in Burnett, Texas. So if you're there, we have a banquet on Saturday, uh, Friday night, and then we shoot a two man team match, which was a ton of fun last year. Uh, on Saturday and Sunday, and that's our our big uh, our big fundraiser for the year, and it's on Halloween this year. So we're going to have a costume party. It's going to be a blast. And then on into November, I thought I was going to slow down a little bit, but Tim Kennedy just reached out and asked me to come teach uh, one of his sheepdog classes. So I think uh, it's the third week in November that uh, I'm going to be teaching back down here in Texas with him. Nice. Yeah, and if uh, anybody wants to. Uh, I'd love for everybody to come follow me on Instagram at die three gun. And then Facebook is Diana Muller three gun. And then the DC project, follow us there on Instagram and Facebook. And if you want to support, or if you know any, if you know our Michael Bloomberg and you want to just introduce, just uh, have them check out DC project.info. And if anybody wants to see the ambassador Academy Academy, hit me up. I don't have dates for 2021, but we'll definitely have a class it's a very small class, 16 people. It's very intimate, and you get a lot of uh, a lot of good information. And you, everybody, lo- everybody loves it. We've had it twice, and, and everybody think, thinks that it's just uh, out of this world. Awesome. Rob. Now you, Rob. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, if you're not familiar, Diana, every guest goes through our rapid fire questions, and Ooh. basically, uh, yeah, this, these are questions. There's ten of them. Okay. Uh, there's no cheating, no studying, uh, no prep. Okay. And it's just first thing that comes to mind, and um, there are no wrong answers. Okay. okay. You ready? I'm, you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. All right. Is competition a good augment to defensive training? Yes. Least favorite skill to practice? Um, long range. Interesting. All right. Biggest training myth? Uh, that guns are bad. It's not a training myth. That's an anti myth. Okay. Pass. <laughs> uh, striker fire, double action, or single action only? Uh, striker fire for tactical, uh, single action. I'll go with your 2011. <laughs> can, can folk to your 1911 for, for competition. Okay. Uh, appendix or strong side hip? Appendix. Uh, in the home. Pistol, rifle, or shotgun? A rifle. Okay. One thing you carry every day other than your gun? Uh, Credit cards. (laughs) Red dot or irons on a pistol? Oh, I like red dots, but I use irons. Okay. Uh, Three books that you can recommend that are must-reads. They don't have to necessarily deal with shooting sports or shooting... Uh, I highly, three, highly recommend uh, With Winning in Mind by Lanny Basham. And then um, along the marketing lines, I love the book uh, Story Brand, I think is what it is. The Story Brand talks about how to tell stories. And then uh, number three, oh my gosh, number three, top three shooting. um, Doesn't have to be. The Bible. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, okay. And then please recommend one peer teacher, trainer, coach, instructor, um, that you, that you would recommend. 
I'll, I'll go with, I'll stick with Waft. Um, Philip Tapino is the guy who owns the place and uh, he's, uh, it comes with very, very minimal credentials, but is at the top of his game, in my opinion, from 22 years in law enforcement. And you are in good company. Um, our first, I think it was uh, Kyle Lamb from Vikings Tactics, uh, retired Sergeant Major Kyle Lamb from Battle of Mogadishu and Black uh-huh. Hawk Down, who recommended the Bible. So you're in good company. There you um, go. Just so you know. <laughs> Folks uh, who have inquired about CCR t-shirts, we have three left in large. $20, www.paypal.me forward slash CC radio. It's large. Please. Why do you even? <laughs> <laughs> stop, Rob, stop. <laughs> so, um, please leave a note in the uh, comment section, your address and your size. Or, well, you only have large now. Sorry. So your address. Large. To become a corporate sponsor or advertise on the show, please send me an email to baraka3 at gmail.com for details. Please share, subscribe, and leave feedback at the bottom of the YouTube if you're watching through YouTube or if you are watching through Facebook. Please share and so we can get the message out to people and continue. Please go to our home at firearmsradio.tv by going to Google and typing in civilian carry radio. That'll take you over to our full show notes that'll be produced tomorrow morning by 9 a.m. I always have them done I usually get up about six and get it posted out to all of our posit, all of our uh, podcasting stations. That has all of our links to our website, our Twitter, our Instagram, our Facebook page, and nine out of the 130 audio podcasting stations that play our show. Just go pick your favorite and type in Civilian Care Radio. But we have the, t- the links to iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spot- Spotify, Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Podbean, On Speaker, Player FM. We also have discounts to our industry partners, Eridus Industries, ATI, Battle Comp, Big Techs Outdoors, Dark Angel Medical, Dark Star Gear Holsters, Fire Clean, and Trident Concepts. Please join us next Wednesday, October the 14th at 8 a.m. 8 p.m. till 9.30 for Ben and Rachel from On-Site Firearms return with our guest co-host, Mr. Ashton Ray. Behind that, we have Miss Beth Alcazar, Peacemakers and Pacifiers. Guest co-host is Mr. Michael Treat. Behind that, we have the sixth, uh, the fourth installment of, or fifth installment of our uh, flirting with that disaster um, series on domestic violence, self-healing to avoid repeat patterns in personal relationships. Behind that, we have Mr. Byron Rogers, owner of Bra- Bravo Research Group, and guest co-host is uh, Mr. John Murphy. Behind that, we have Mr. Andy Staff, Andy Stanford, an- uh, analyst for Surefire, published author, defensive weapons and tactical um instructor guest host is mr steve moses as we always said and we said in this whole one and we say every week please check out dc project rally for gun rights www.dcproject.info and then from with that we take to final thoughts alan sams uh yeah i think it's uh i think it's awesome that you uh you know you go to dc somebody asks you if you want to meet your uh congressman and you end up you know, involved in this thing like you are. Um, I think everybody out there needs to understand that um, you can do something. I mean, if this is important to you, which I I think to a a growing number of Americans, it it is becoming more and more important. And I think people are understanding um, that, um, you know, this right, um, you know, not only secures your other rights, but uh, I mean, it's, it's more and more people. I mean, as, as, as things get, as things get worse and, uh, uh, you know, if this police situation doesn't get, uh, remedied before we don't have those anymore, um, it's, it's going to get down to, you know, you protecting your family. And I, and again, I think more and more Americans have understood that that's why when you go to a, a, a gun store that normally has three, 400 guns in there, um, ranging from, um, you know, top to the bottom of the gamut now they have uh single action cowboy guns is what's left um that that there's a reason um there's a reason why a lot of people are 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 starting to understand how important this right is um we talked about it in our uh police series on police training uh you know chuck haggard said you know you get the you know you get the police force that you vote for well you get the government that you vote for you get the the gun laws that you get to vote for um all that stuff so we have to take part everybody's got to take part in this thing and um you know 
Diana and her husband are a perfect example. Of what happens when, um, <laughs> you know, you've decided, you decide to do something. Um, so, uh, I just say everybody, you know, figure out what it is that you can do, no matter how small you think it is, whether it's writing a letter or email once a week or something like that, or, or getting as involved as Diana and Tatiana are. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Alan, Mr. Mark Bridgen would like is there to know, is there any updates on hats? Question mark. Uh, I'll have to check. Uh, they were, when I got them sent out, you know, the order sent out, it was four to six week lead time. But you know how things are in a post-COVID war. I mean, All right. So world. sit tight, Mark. We're, <laughs> Alan's working on it. We'll let you know as soon as we can. Mr. Rob Cavallari, final thoughts, brother. All right. So, Diana, first of all, thank you very much for your time tonight. I know, like all of us, you're probably, well, more more, more than all of us, probably are very busy. So I really appreciate your time coming on tonight and sharing uh, your insights with us. I think I grew up in a shooting environment that was uh, heavily, had women heavily involved. I competed at a Division One NCAA school in a sport that um, I think is still the only sport that is co-ed. In other words, men and women compete equally against each other for the mm -hmm. national championship. And so I was taught by and competed with world-class Olympic athletes, uh, female athletes. And they, you know, growing up in that environment, I didn't think of them as I'm shooting against a girl. It was I'm shooting against a competitor. Mm -hmm. And I think bringing um, women to the fight for the 2A that, that uh, DC Project does is critical for the future of shooting sports, Second Amendment. And I'm really... I'm thankful that you are, you know, leading part of that charge. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Lee Weems, final thoughts, brother. Uh, my, f I think the favorite thing I heard tonight was that the Second Amendment issue is a constitutional issue, not a partisan issue. Uh, I think truer words than that can cannot be spoken. Um, and then on the the whole self defense issue and being a human right. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the show, one of my guys was involved in a shooting within the last couple of weeks and the GBI is doing their thing in investigating. And I have nothing but positive things to say about the agent that's, that's conducting the investigation. But, you know, yesterday uh, she came and she was going, she was going through the deputy's personnel file. And then the day we were pulling every use of force that he's been involved in for his entire career. Uh, him and the other officer that or the deputy that was involved and i couldn't help but think and i said this to the to the agent i said you know the most heinous person on the planet that's been in prison for the most heinous crimes that you can think of but is getting released and they're attacked on the steps to the prison has a human right to defend themselves and all that matters is whether or not their use of force in that situation is legally justified. I said, but the deputy in the same has that same right too. All that needs to be looked at in this investigation is was his use of force at the time he used the force, was it legally justified? Right. That's what the law demands. The law does not demand that you go back to every use of force that he's been involved in uh, since his career began working in the jail in 2014 through 2020 let's go back and through six years of this guy's life and pull through and go through everything none of that has any relevance on the fact that a woman charged him with a knife after saying she was going to kill him and he had to use deadly force to defend himself and and the other deputy that was with him you know folks I, that's the position we're in now mm -hmm. i know that that's the way this is being looked at now it's not were you justified at the moment of your decision, the most important decision you're going to have to make in your life, it's your entire life's going to be brought up to bear. And I think that's things we need to be thinking about in like our social media uh, pontifications and the way we live our lives is, folks, your whole life's going to go up under a microscope. And please keep that in mind. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you, Lee. And before I leave uh, the final, final thought with our guest, I'd just like to thank all of you on the panel for your time tonight. Thank you, all of us, all of you in the live chat for your time. Thank you for your continued support. We're doing this because we believe in this. And again, please hear and heed what we say. The, the biggest points I always want to reinforce and leave you guys off with is 
First of all, as Diana said, you are your own first responder. They will, the police will never make it on time. And second is what we always say, remember you and the only you are responsible for the safety and protection of yourself and your loved ones. Do not leave that on the table for anyone else because you will be sorely disappointed and you need to take responsibility for your own lives and the lives of the people you love and care about. And with that being said, let me pass the very final thought to Diane, please. Thank you. Well, first, let me thank you guys for inviting me on. It's been, it did go by fast. And um, you mentioned shirts. I want to let everybody know that's uh, listening that you can join our effort to be a counter visual to Moms Demand Action is to get our teal shirt off of dcproject.info slash shop. So this says educate and it's crossed out over uh, legislate and it's got some ARs on it. So it's a great, uh, you know, great icebreaker and people really um, can start conversations that they normally may not be able to have. So especially in today's day, but you can join us as well at dcproject.info slash join to, to get plugged into your state. And, and if you want to do something, we'll help you uh, learn along the way because we're, we're new at this as well. Thank you so much, Diane. I appreciate it. Folks, in the words of our good friend and mentor, Lynn Gibbons, I do not carry a pistol so I can impose my will on someone else. I carry a pistol so someone cannot impose their will on me. For me, and what I encourage people to do is they're going to carry, is to carry as an act of love. It is not because of fear or hate or anger, but we carry because we love life, we love our families, and that is something worth protecting by Mr. Tim Reedy. Good night, good folks. Please take care of yourself. Stay safe. Be positive. Remain vigilant. See you guys next week. God bless you and have a good night. Thank you.